people of God. Well, I'm actually currently editing the video that you're about to listen to. And of course, the enemy's not happy about this video coming out. So I kept getting restart notifications on my computer from a program that wants to update itself. And I kept hitting close on it. And then all of a sudden now my power went out for just, it wasn't even a second. It just blinked out and the computer and everything came back on. And it's really just the enemy's attempt to stop this um, audio message from coming forward because he doesn't want anyone to get set free. So with that being said, what I want you to do is if you know anyone who is in a volatile relationship, regardless of whether they're being abused or not, see the thing is a lot of cases you deal with women who are being abused, but they're not going to tell you. But if you know somebody who's in a volatile relationship, make sure you share this video with them. And of course, if you know somebody who is in an abusive relationship, make sure you share this audio message with somebody. The thing is, a lot of times victims of abuse don't even realize that they're victims of abuse. I've been there before and I do understand the mindset and the heart of a victim, especially if that person grew up in chaos. They see it's just another day and that's the sad part. It's just another day to them. It's just another problem, something else they have to overcome. They look at life, well, you know what, as bad as it is, I've survived this far. And they learn to kind of survive in um, those type of situations. So if you know somebody who is the victim of abuse, make sure you share this video or this audio message with them because you may be the person that God uses to save that person's life. Sometimes we don't want to get involved. Sometimes we don't want to say anything because, hey, listen, the reality is anytime you get involved, you know, when you're dealing with somebody who's an, abic an abuse victim and that person doesn't want to get set free, if they want to stay with the person, then automatically they have to offer you up as a sacrifice. They will sacrifice their relationship with you in order to please the person who's abusing them. That's the reality. That's just how it works. Whenever you're dealing with somebody who's going through abuse, I'm going to tell you something about the abuse I didn't mention in the audio, but what the abuser will do is he rewards the person. And like I said, it could be a man or a woman, but I'm using it in the male form because we mostly hear about women getting abused. But anyhow, he will reward the woman for doing what he wants her to do. And at the same time, he will reward her for giving him information. So when you go out and you reach out to an abuse victim, in a lot of cases, what the abuser is going to do is, let's say, for example, this happens to be a close friend of yours. And you go and you talk to her and you tell her, hey, it's not God's will for you to be abused. It's not God's will for you to go through what you're going through. That is not the will of God then what's going to happen is she'll listen to you. And if she doesn't want to get set free, then she will offer you up as a sacrifice. That is the truth. And a lot of times we don't want to get involved because we don't want to become the person that she lays on the altar. We don't want to become the person that she goes and tries to, you know, give in exchange for a good day or give in exchange for, you know, um, him trying to get him to become right you do become a bargaining tool with an abuse victim and in a lot of cases I want to be honest with you not every woman is like that I know for me when I went through it I wasn't like that and that's why when I minister to women who are victims of abuse I try to warn them to not burn their bridges because I do know how abusers think an abuser will take a woman that he's been beating on. I know we are supposed to be doing a prelude to the message, but I want to go ahead and say this. An abuser will take a woman that he's beating on and he'll mishandle her. He'll mistreat her. If he sees any signs of change in her, if he sees any signs of, a re of resistance that he didn't see before, then he will try to pick her mind and find out who's speaking into her life. He wants to find out who is helping her. And a lot of times she's going to give up her source because that's a bargaining tool for her. See, for her, she thinks that, well, if I come and I tell him what he wants to hear, then he'll love me more. He'll see that I'm dedicated to him. He'll see that I'm not putting another person before him. He'll see that I am in this for life. Like I'm not trying to leave. And some of you who've been the victims of abuse, you recognize this. A lot of cases, what the abuser will do is he will entertain a woman. Let's say he's beat her up the day before and he's mishandled her, but then she comes home from work or a couple of days later, what he'll do is he'll cook dinner for her. He'll um, 
treat her like a princess. He may even take her out to eat, take her to a movie. He'll take her to a park. He'll go do something that she wants. He'll sit down and he'll apologize to her. He will start feeding into what she wants because the abuser is going to always learn your fantasy. He's going to always use that as a bargaining tool, something to hold over your head. So you become like a hungry dog you become like a hungry pit bull you're always trying to get that meat and just when you think you're about to get it he holds it up and then what he'll do is he'll break off little pieces and hand it to you but what happens with the abuser is the abuser will utilize um that moment to get her to give up her sources he'll take her out he'll treat, treat her like a princess and he'll give her a sample of the life that she's always wanted with him he'll make her think that you know things are starting to get better and I do love you and everything. He'll start talking to her. He'll lay in the bed and he'll actually start confessing. You see, I like to put the devil on display. I like to expose the devil because a lot of women don't realize that they're not the only ones who are going through this. They don't realize that they're not the only ones who have gone through this. So what he'll do is he'll lay in the bed uh, or he'll, you know, walk around talking to her. He'll open up. And most of the time, women, we want to talk. And the abuser knows that he finds out what it is that you want. He may pretend he doesn't know because any other time he's not entertaining your desire to talk to him. He's ignoring you. But this particular time, he will sit down and talk with you, listen to you, and he'll tell you secrets that he's never told anybody or something he claims to have never told anybody. He'll make you feel open. He'll make you feel like you want to be open. And then he'll slowly pick it out of you. Who has been in your ear? Who's been talking to you? Who is Who has been encouraging you? He wants you to give up your source. And in a lot of cases, the woman will give up her source. In a lot of cases, she'll say, well, um, my best friend and my auntie and my cousin and my pastor. And then slowly but surely, he'll start pulling her away from every last one of those people. He will get her to burn that bridge. Now, if she's not willing to burn the bridge, what he'll do is he'll confront the person. He's going to drive everybody who's trying to help her out of her life. And this is one of the things I want to say before we go into the message. If you happen to be a victim of abuse, of course, you need to get out of that relationship. But another thing that you need to know is do not burn your bridges. I'm going to do a part two because there's a lot of information um, about the spirit of abuse when you're dealing with an abusive type. But I want to tell you, do not burn your bridges. That is the craziest and stupidest thing I've ever seen anybody do. Do not burn your bridges. Don't run around giving up your source and telling the guy who is, you know, helping you out. If somebody gave you money to help you out, don't go buy the man a pair of shoes with that money and then turn around and tell him, well, my dad gave me um, $500 to leave and because you're trying to prove a point to him because at the end of the day, he's going to smile. He's going to put a smirk on his face and he's going to think to himself, okay, I got to drive her away from her father now. This is how abusers think. A lot of times, like I said, women will sit back and they will give up their source. I, one of the things I did when I was in that type of relationship and when I started realizing it was bad, even before I realized that I was in a dangerous situation, what I did was I did not give up my source. If somebody said something to me, I kept my mouth shut because I realized that these people were trying to help me. That's how I saw people. And I saw the opportunities. I saw opportunities to put those people on the altar. I saw opportunities. You know, of course, uh, the man, he's going to um, make love to you like he's never made love to you before. He's going to treat you like a princess. He's going to do a lot of stuff to get you to give up your source. He's going to start talking about having children with you, traveling with you. He's going to do whatever it is. He's going to hand you a piece of that steak that he's been holding over your head. And he's going to get you to uh, crave and more. And then for him to break off another piece he needs you to give up some more information so he'll use that against you he'll have you sitting there wagging your tail and jumping up in the air trying to get that little piece and he'll say so um i noticed that you you don't usually act like that like i know we fight and you know we're it's normal for couples to fight and what have you i know that um we have our problems because everybody has their problems but um has somebody been in your ear has somebody been talking to you? And a lot of times, like I said, you'll have the girl, she'll sit there, she'll stop, and she'll get quiet for a minute. And he'll say, I'm not going to say nothing to him. I, I don't want to, um, you know, come against him or nothing like that. But I'm just trying to see because I feel like somebody's been in your ear. And while she's sitting there thinking, the enemy starts telling her, like, look, 
y'all are having a really good uh, time right now. If you don't tell him, it's going to escalate. He's going to get angry with you. You are about to get what you want. He's about to give you the desire of your heart. He's about to give you the desires of your heart. He's about to give you whatever it is you've been dreaming about. But in this moment, you're going to have to give that person up. So I know you're probably saying, then why should I try to help a person like that? Because I don't want to send somebody to video and then they turn around and put me on the altar. A lot of people who have lost their lives didn't have to lose their lives if somebody had simply gotten involved. And I know you're probably saying, well, I don't want to lose my life trying to help her out. You know, I want to try to preserve my own life. When you're dealing with an abuser, sometimes the best thing to do, of course, you pray, you cover yourself with the blood of Jesus, but you can have a man to send it to her. If you, you know, happen to be in her family or what have you, if she has a brother that he's afraid of, have him to send a video to her. You don't have to necessarily be the person that sends it to her because most abusers are cowards. They will not go after a man. They'll go after certain men. You know, if the man happens to be um, scary, he's um, bound by the spirit of fear or what have you, of course, they'll go after that type of guy. But most of the time, an abuser will have certain people that they won't mess with. It doesn't matter how crazy they get. They will never be crazy enough to go to that particular guy. Or you don't have to send the video to her in your name. How about this? You create a Gmail account or another account and you send her the video and say, hey, I wanted you to check out this video. I'm an anonymous source and um, I love you and I know about what's going on in your home and I want to send you this video. Either way, you want to make sure that she sees this video, even if you share it on your Facebook page, whatever it is that you do, make sure that the people see this video because you have no idea the power that the abuser has over the other person a lot of times people try to talk the abuse victim into leaving and they don't understand why the abuse victim won't leave it's because they think that their situation is unique and that it's going to change they think that you know i'm the only person who's going through this i'm the only person who knows him the way i know him they think that their situation is unique but when they come to find out that that demon acts the same way and um, every person it gets in, then they come to understand that, hey, this is a person who's not going to change. They have to have a mind change about the person. They got to have a mind change about the whole idea of being abused. They got to look at it for what it is and they got to come to realize this man does not love me or that woman does not love me. And sometimes the thing that we can do anytime you're dealing with an abuse victim is you build them up. That's the way you get an abuse victim to leave is you build the person up because she's used to being torn down or he's used to being torn down by the person that he or she is with. But you build that person up, you encourage him, you love on them. And at the same time, you give them the necessary information. You don't necessarily come and try to tell them, leave, 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 because the natural um, mindset of the abuse victim, because the person who's been abusing them has been in their ear, has been actually doing what I call is witchcraft because they are using lies. They're using words to bewitch the other person. They're using their charm. They're using their power, their authority, and the soul tie that they have with that person to manipulate and control the other person. So whenever you go and you start telling her to leave, 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 then the natural response for her is, I need to protect my relationship from you because you don't understand him. Like, yeah, okay, I understand that he's bad. I understand he hit me. I understand that, you know, um, he's a dangerous person, but he's a teddy bear underneath it all. He's a really nice guy. You don't know the conversations we had. You don't know what we do and you know behind closed doors. You don't know. It's because she's convinced herself that they actually have a loving, great, wonderful um, storybook romance that the only problem is she just needs to get those demons out of him. She just needs to help him to not be so angry. And she thinks that things will change from there. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that she comes to understand that her situation is not unique. You need to help her to understand that she is one of many women who are in abusive relationships. And she may very well be that one who ends up losing her life. For what she thinks is love, when in reality it is adultery. God never called us to be victims of abuse. That is not God's will for us. It is not God's will for us to sit there and allow somebody to beat us, to mishandle us, to mistreat us, 
to, you know, just be condescending. It's not the will of God. And sometimes people don't know that. So when you're dealing with a victim of abuse, what you need to do is you got to understand that they have old information. They need new information. You give them new information. Don't be so much in their ear talking about leave, 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 leave. Whenever you're dealing with an abuse victim, I'm going to tell you the best thing to do with that person is you take her out, you treat her, um, is you take her out, like, for example, you like to hang out. Of course, I'm talking to women. If you happen to have a friend who's a victim of abuse, and guys, if you happen to have a friend who's a victim of abuse, I'm not talking about taking somebody out from the opposite sex because you can actually put them in danger. But, you know, as a woman, for example, you hang out with your friend. If your friend happens to be a victim of abuse, of course, you pray for her. You cover yourself with the blood of Jesus. But you go and you take her, for example, to the beach with you and let her see you having a great time. Let her see you live in life. If you happen to be married and you have a God-fearing husband, let her see the interaction between you and your husband. The thing is, she just needs new information. One of the things that an abuser will t has a tendency to do is he likes to cut her off from people who will encourage her to want something better. When he brings her around his friends, he's going to bring her around people who are far worse than himself. He's going to bring her around people who are narcissistic and dark who don't have it going on you know he's going to bring her around people that he's smarter than because what he wants to do is leave something to be desired and you know he can show himself as a better man and he can sit there and you know look at that guy and say yeah so you just got out of jail yeah right okay no man you don't need to be hitting her like that and what it is the difference between him and the other guy for example your guy is you know, doing open hand slapping. He's doing stuff like that. But her guy has a tendency to punch her and drag her. And he'll, you know, get in the car with you. And he'll say, you know what? I know I got my issues. I know I got to get help. But that dude is crazy. You know, you know what he did to that girl? Do you know he body slammed her? He punched her. He kicked her. And there's a lot of people had to bring him off of her. What he's doing is he's actually telling the girl that it could be worse for you. This is a form of abuse. This is him just tearing her down. It's mental abuse first, and then it starts into physical abuse. When you're dealing with mental abuse, the abuser is not going to always fashion the abuse to look like abuse. What he'll do is he'll have conversations with you. Like the two of you are getting along, and you'll notice that those conversations make you a little bit uncomfortable. But the two of you are getting along, and everything is looking good and sounding good. But why is he talking to me about you know, I know I got my problems and everything, but do you know what he did with her? You know, they said she tried to get in the car and he was pulling off and he dragged her halfway up the street. Like I said, I know I got my issues. Really what he's trying to tell her is this. You might as well stay with me because this is what you got to look forward to if you leave me. Everybody's going through something. I'm a good guy. There's more hope for me than there is for him. A lot of times when you're dealing with abusers, they will always surround themselves with losers who are far more advanced in their stupidity than they are. And, you know, they'll try to get around the guy and they'll, you know, sit back and slap hands with him and be like, what's up, man? And the whole purpose of the visit is to really work on you. That's the heart and the mind of the abuser. Like I said, I'm going to do a part two to this series because there's a lot of information that you don't know about an abuser. So it is to tell you ladies that um, you'll notice, for um, example, if you happen to be in an abusive relationship that that guy has a tendency to take you around certain people and he'll keep you away from anybody who has a really good relationship because he does not want to have to compete with that person. He does not want you to see a good relationship and know that, hey, I can have this too. It is not the will of God for me to be sitting here getting my face bashed in. It's not the will of God for me to be getting choked and body slammed. I knew a woman once who, um, she had problems with her husband and she left and they were going through a divorce, I think. And she allowed him to come back. She allowed him and she didn't let him come back completely in to move back in with her. But she started back having, you know, relations with him and he was buying her roses. And I, I would never forget. She was a coworker of mine, but I'll never forget her story. She said that um, they had gotten into it. You know, he went right back in. Um, he came to visit her and I don't know why he got upset with her. But he choked her so hard and so bad that she went unconscious and she woke up in a puddle of her own urine. This is what happens to victims of abuse. So this is my goal with this audio message is to inform you. 
for those of you who are not victims of abuse, you need to be informed too, so that you don't end up in a relationship like this and you can recognize the warning signs. And at the same time, you can recognize the warning signs with other people. So you get around folks who are victims of abuse, you will know what to look for. And that's the purpose of this audio. I, I really want to give more information. There's a lot, like I said, to be said about the spirit of abuse, but um, it's going to take another part two, probably even a part three. Hopefully we'll be able to cover a lot of information in part two, but I want to go ahead and I definitely know that I have to put some more information out there because a lot of people are uninformed about that. A lot of people think that, well, she's stupid. She's stuck with him. Why is she sitting with him when he is abusing her? And I got to tell you, I was a firecracker of a woman when I was in the world. I was the type of woman who would not tolerate a man to put her, put his hands on me. I had a lot of rage and a lot of things. But God will give you a spirit of wisdom to help you to survive in a situation like that. You will be sitting back in your foolishness with a spirit of wisdom. And, you know, it's just enough wisdom to get you by. And it's basically when you're dealing with somebody like that, God will tell you, don't fight back. There were times when I was in a situation, I would be fighting back and I would hear the Lord say, stop. I would just hear a voice tell me to stop fighting. Just I would stand there and it, there was this voice that said, stop. And I didn't realize that the Lord was actually protecting me. I didn't realize that the Lord was saying, you're not fighting against flesh and blood at this moment. You're swinging. Sure, you're hitting his body. You're hitting him. But you're not fighting against flesh and blood at this moment. At this moment, you're fighting against something that's trying to push him over the edge into killing you. And you're helping that thing to push him over the edge by constantly fighting back. So the Lord would have me a lot of times, you know, in that case to to stop and just freeze up. And I didn't realize what I was doing at that time. I didn't realize what God was doing, but I would just look and I would see something dark in his eyes and I would just freeze up and I stopped fighting. And, you know, of course he's standing there and his thing, uh, his main thing was choking me, but he will stand there and he'll still choke me for a minute and then he'll let me loose and he'll start talking and screaming and cursing. And it was a, a spirit of peace that came over me like be quiet don't say a word stop fighting don't fight don't say a word just be quiet I didn't realize that God was giving me a spirit of wisdom at that time he was actually protecting me because I didn't see what was in him I came to understand now if you ever see two dogs fighting what happens is the aggressor will attack the other dog if you have two dogs and both of them come into a fight both of them are trying to be aggressive then um the dog who's wounded or realizes that he's the weaker one, he will stop fighting. A lot of times what he'll do is he'll lower himself. He'll lower his head. He'll let the other dog know, I'm submitting to you. We don't have to continue this fight. He's doing this to survive. So I want to warn you, ladies, if you happen to know a victim of abuse, one of the things that you do not say is you ought to pick something up and knock him out. You ought to do this or you ought to do that. Anything past telling her to leave is something you should not be putting in her ear because if you're telling her from your pride, pick something up and knock him out, you don't even realize that you may put that woman's life in danger because when she's dealing with this man, he may get crunk and it's a, a demon in this dude. It's a demon that's trying to get him to come, go over the edge and that'd be the very thing that the devil uses to push him on over the edge and the devil will tell her you know, through you to pick something up and knock them over his head. I want you to understand that sometimes people can have demons. You can hit them and they won't feel it. That adrenaline and that demon will keep them from feeling anything. So she can go and pick up a porcelain towel off the floor and hit this, this dude across the head with it. And he will stand there and that will be all that demon in him needs to take care of life because he'll look at it like, wow. You really just hit me across my head with a porcelain towel. And then he'll use that and the, the devil in him will say, okay, it's time to take her life. It's time to escalate your attack and she'll end up losing her life. So don't do that. I'm telling you from a former victim of abuse, don't do that. Don't tell somebody to, you know, go and do this or go and do that. Everything short of leaving him is bad advice. The only thing you need to do is build her up. Let her know that it's not normal. Let her, know, let her know that God loves her. Let her know that it is not the will of God that she endures that. Let her know that her children are in danger. Let her know that she's in danger. And that's all you need to do with her. Outside of that, you have to be careful. And if she's not receiving what God is saying through you, then the only thing you can do for her is pray for her. That's all. You can pray for her and keep watch. Don't go around 
talking about her. Don't go around putting her business out there because you're not helping her. You're helping the abuser to hold on to her because what he'll do is he'll convince her. See, that friend of yours, you thought that was your girl looking at she to put your business all out in the street. And, you know, he's going to always try to isolate her. That is the, the behavior of an abuser. He wants to isolate the victim from anybody who loves him. He does not want his victim to have anybody in her circle who actually loves her because they pose a threat to his relationship or his plans, his plots, his schemes to her. They pose a threat to what he's trying to build. And see, the way he sees the people in her life, are you either helping me to build what I'm trying to build in her or are you tearing it down? That is the way he sees it. He looks at it like, okay, if you're telling her to stay with me, and you're telling her that it's going to get better. You're helping me. You're working on a team with me. And the two of us are working to get her to where I want her to be. But if you're telling her that it's not normal, that it's not the will of God, and that I need help, then you're working against what I'm trying to do in her. And then you become a threat, and he's going to separate her from you. He's going to get her to walk away from you because his plans are being threatened by you. And I need to insert this part just as a warning because I realized that a lot of the information I put in here um, didn't talk about the woman who actually likes being abused. There is a such a thing as a woman who likes being abused. That is the reality. It is sad. It is something we can't comprehend, not with a sane mind. That is something that we can't fathom. But there is a such thing as a woman who actually likes to be abused. And the reality is she thinks that is love. When her guy hits her, she thinks that he is proving his love for her. She'll say, for example, you know, he got really jealous. He got really mad. He saw me talking to my coworker and that really ticked him off. And for her, she may complain about it, but in reality, she takes it in like, wow, I can't believe how jealous he is. This dude really loves me. She doesn't know what love is. She doesn't know who love is. She knows about God, but she doesn't understand what love means because God is love. She doesn't understand the very definition and the very heart of God. So she thinks that it is love. When you're dealing with somebody like that, I want to warn you. If you discern, of course, you need to pray about it. But if you discern that that woman actually likes being abused, if you discern that she is sitting back and, you know, for example, she's pushing his buttons, trying to get him to hit her, then you need to pull all the way out. The only thing that you need to do is pray for her from a distance, pull all the way out. I'm not talking about deal with her, but don't talk to her about the abuse. You need to pull all the way out because women like this can be very, very dangerous. What they have a tendency to do, for example, is they'll come and they'll play little mind games with him. Because they're too busy trying to get what they want out of the relationship. And the guy, for example, he's hitting the woman to get what he wants. He's abusing her, manipulating her, controlling her. He's doing a lot of stuff. But the woman, on the other hand, she's doing some things to try to get what she wants out of him. So you got two emotionally unstable, demonically possessed people who are actually sitting back playing mind games with each other and doing a lot of crazy stuff. So when you're dealing with a situation like that, I want to sit here and I got to make sure I warn you on this. Pull all the way out. Don't let that woman infest your house and your ears with what she's going through. Don't let her come to your house and talk about, girl, he, he slapped me yesterday or he did this. Because sometimes people like that, they actually like it. Like I said, they are demonically attracted to each other and they can be really, really dangerous. They will put people in danger because for them, you are nothing but a human sacrifice to help them to get whatever it is that they want from their relationship. Now, I want to say to the victims of abuse, I don't want you to think that just because you sat there and you got hit that you actually like it. I don't want you to get that in your mind. I'm actually talking about women who will sit back and they may even complain about the guy hitting them, but they will literally, I'm talking about intentionally. I'm not talking about something you did that was unintentional. I'm talking about these ladies will intentionally press the guy's buttons because they want him to hit them. Now, you may have times where you press his buttons and it wasn't intentional or you press his buttons because you were trying to talk to him, but you have some women who will actually sit back and press that guy's buttons because they want to be hit because they want to feel love and whenever you're dealing with somebody like that you need to completely 
disassociate yourself from that person because that person is dangerous they like to play mind games and not only do they put their own lives in danger but they'll put your life in danger it's all this little crazy game this old game of charades or what have you it's just a crazy game so i wanted to stop in and make sure that i issue this warning i don't want to send you out there and you come across a woman who actually likes being abused. You come across a woman who likes her situation and she thinks it's one big love story, one big romance story. And you come in and you don't even realize that she'll play you. She'll sit there and she'll act like, you know, yeah, he did this to me. He did that to me. She will actually sit there and play games with you because she wants to use you as a pawn in her little mind games that she's playing with him. And for her, she'll dehumanize you. You're not a human being to her. To her, you're just another toy to play with. So I want to warn you that way you don't end up on the wrong side of that. If you discern that a woman is in an abusive relationship and she needs more information and she's trying to get out or she just is in adultery and she doesn't know what to do, yeah, then make sure she gets this information. And of course, if you're dealing with somebody who likes to play mind games, you want to make sure that they see the information. I wouldn't necessarily tag a minute. I would just post it to my page or something like that. Whenever you're dealing with somebody who likes to play mind games, you're dealing with a person who they actually, it's kind of like the demons are out in a field. They actually like playing with the demons. They like pressing his buttons to see how far he'll go or what he'll do because she is convinced in her own mind that everything he's doing to her is um, a fountain of love pouring out from his life and even though the waters are bitter they are the evidence of his love and for her like I said she will use people in her game she will use people as a pawn to get what she want out of that relationship and you want to make sure that anytime you come across a woman like that like I said, pull all the way out, disassociate from her, cut her off, and don't reopen that door. So I just wanted to issue this warning. I don't want you to go after the wrong type of woman. But anyhow, we're going to go ahead and get into the message. Um, of course, we're going to have Friday's conference call. It's going to be at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we're going to be talking about the strength of humility. Now, it may not seem like a powerful call, but I want you to come on. I dare you to come on and listen to that call. It's going to bless you. Anyhow, I'll see you on Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I love you, people of God, and I hope this message blesses you. Let's go ahead and get into the message. Hello, and welcome back to Anointed Fire. My name is Tiffany Buckner, and this is a message to the victims of abuse. And of course, I'm going to talk mainly to women, but I do want you to understand that this can apply to men as well. I want you to understand abuse. I want you to understand the heart of abuse. I want you to understand the purpose of abuse. I want you to understand the consequence of abuse. The thing about abuse, a lot of times when we're dealing with physical abuse, the person who's being abused wants to believe that there is hope, that the person who's hitting them, the person who's hurting them is going to straighten up and fly right. They want to believe that that person sincerely loves them. So they tell themselves that, you know, He's just acting up or she's just acting up and this is how he acts when he gets mad. But any other day of the week, he's a really good guy. He's a really nice guy. He has come to my defense many times. He has stood um, up for me. I've even seen him. I've even seen him pray for me. He has talked to me. Don't nobody know me like he does and don't nobody know him like I do when he comes and he talks to me people are not there to hear the conversation so it's easy for them to judge one of the things I found is that anytime you're dealing with a victim of abuse that person will justify the abusers actions the person will sit back and say well you know you know what actually when they're mad at them and when they come to their right mind just temporarily and this is a sad thing whenever you're living in an abusive relationship you are not temporarily insane you are just insane and then you have temporary moments of sanity so a person who's in an abusive relationship has temporary sanity and then they go back to insanity as opposed to a person who is just normal can have a moment of what we call temporary insanity. So you'll have this woman who's in an abusive relationship and she she's living by all of the lies that she's told herself and that the guy has told her. She's living off of all of those lies. She's not living in the present truth. She's living off of lies. So then what ends up happening is this you know, God does something to her. For example, he upsets her, he hits her, and then she goes into sanity briefly. And she'll get up, and that's when she'll start talking, and she'll say, 
I got to get away from him. He's stupid. He's crazy. He keeps hitting on me. This isn't right. This is not what God wants me to be. This is not how I'm supposed to be treated. She'll call you up on the phone and she'll cry her heart out. She'll have a moment of temporary sanity. But then if you catch her a little bit later, after that guy has worked on her, after that demon in that guy has worked on her, she's right back into being under that spell. You talk to her a little bit later, most of the time she's not going to answer her phone. If she made up her mind to reconcile with the guy and she knows that everybody else is still kind of upset about what happened, when you call her, she's not going to answer her phone. When she does answer her phone, most of the time it's going to be a couple of days later. Then she'll sit back and say, um, yeah, we talked. And that's the most common thing for a woman who is the victim of abuse to say, we talked. What she's saying is you don't know what was discussed between the two of us. We have a great romantic loving relationship and we've talked about it. So we're going to work this out. And she tries to keep the conversation short. And if you keep pressing, she's either going to get off the phone with you or she's going to tell you some of the things that she's holding on to. She'll say, for example, well, you know, his dad was abusive toward him. And when he was talking to me, like he told me, that this happened to him and that happened to him and you know he wants to get help he said when he was at work today he walked up to his boss man and he broke down crying and he told his boss look you know i need some help are there any programs here to help me the the abuser is always going to give the woman something to hold on to especially if he feels like she is starting to slip out of his hands so the thing is anytime you're dealing with a victim of abuse. I want you to understand that they are under a spell of witchcraft. They are under a spell. Now, this guy may not be chanting and burning incense and doing stuff like that. But what he is doing is he's using his words. He is using crafty words to keep her. He'll sit back and he'll talk to her and he'll say, hey, look, I really love you. It hurt my heart to see what I did to you. I tried to drive off of a cliff today and it was at the last minute that i thought about my children and you know he'll make her think that oh i'm a tormented soul and i just need you to be patient with me because i'm going to straighten up and fly right i need you to help me and he'll give her this dream to hold on to so she starts holding on to the fantasy that okay he's saying he needs help he wants help or what have you so as of right now, it looks like he is making progress. So she'll hold on to that dream and he'll actually go out. He may even go to a place and say, hey, you know, um, I need a brochure. And he doesn't really want help. Because I want you to understand something about, something about the abuser. Something that a lot of women and men don't understand. Whenever you're dealing with somebody who is physically abusive, emotionally abusive, in a lot of cases, the majority of the cases, nine times out of ten, your case that person is addicted to power. They love having power over another human being. One of the things I found out about an abuser is that the abuser has crashed his or her life. Their life is not amounting to anything. It's not amounting to what they want. And a lot of cases, they have a lot of hurt, pain, and rejection. A lot of things that are going on in their lives. And they have a spirit called a spirit of vengeance. But yet and still, the people that they're angry with, they don't have access to them or they're too afraid to go and confront them. So they take out their anger on the person who is currently with them. And that's why I tell women, and you know, this is true for guys too, but that's why I tell women, every time a man offers to love you is not a compliment. Every time a man offers to have a serious relationship with you or to even marry you, that is not necessarily a compliment. You got to understand what he sees love or how he sees love. Some people think that, okay, you know, I talked to this guy on the phone and everybody told me the last three girlfriends he had, he beat up on them or what have you. But I talked to him about it and we talked really good. And he told me, you know, he had some issues back then. He told me he was drinking back then. And he told me that he's not that person anymore. And at the same time, we talked about marriage. You don't understand what that man is saying. When he says, I want to marry you, when he says, I want to have children with you, it's not the same thing as if a sane, godly man says that. A sane, godly man is actually saying, I want to have children with you. I want to be married to you. I want to spend my life with you. But when you're dealing with a narcissist, a psychopath, somebody who has a lot of spirits in them, 
What they're saying is, I need a human punching bag. This is the reality, y'all. This is the reality. That guy is saying, I want a human punching bag. I want you to sit there and allow me to take out my anger and my frustration on you because I don't see you as a human being. I don't see you as a person who deserves the best. You know, sometimes when you're dealing with an abuser, he can come across a woman who he thinks deserves the world. And, he, you know, he may kind of take her out of the category of women. Let's say, for example, he has a problem with women. He was abused, mishandled, mistreated by his own mom. And then, you know, he has some aunties that mishandled him. So his whole life has been him being surrounded by not so good women. Or even if he had a mom who spoiled him, because the reality is a woman who abuses and mishandles her son She's bad and she does a lot of wicked things to her son. But do you understand that a mama who spoils her son and does not discipline him is equally as bad and her son will exhibit the same behaviors. He'll get up and he'll be just as abusive as the man whose mom was abusing him because the Bible says a parent who doesn't discipline their child hates their child. I didn't understand that until I got a chance to see some of my family members that I knew were spoiled. And the amazing thing is they grew up to be so toxic and so angry and so frustrated. And they usually lash out against the person who did not discipline them, the person who was supposed to discipline them. So let's say that you're with this guy and he has all of these issues and, you know, he was abused or he was not abused. He wasn't disciplined at all. And you end up with him. You're thinking in your mind that, okay, he's offering to love you. But in reality, the guy is saying that, okay, I saw this other girl over here, but I think she's a good person. I don't see her as a woman because he's, you know, learned to look at women as uh, wicked creatures. That's what happens when you're dealing with an abuser. A lot of times they generalize. So he looks over at all other women. He thinks these are monsters. They are horrible. But he may have that one best friend, that female that doesn't know how he is. And this girl he got a chance to really get to know her. You know, she sits back and she talks to him and he starts to see her as a different breed. Even though he identifies her as a woman, he doesn't necessarily see her as a woman because she's not romantically involved with him. At the same time, he got a chance to hear her. See, the thing about it, like when you're dealing with a killer or a, a psychopath, they have a tendency to dehumanize their victims. They don't see their victims as human. And that's why FBI, CIA, and all that other stuff, what they will recommend that a woman do is to try to show herself as human because the guy has learned to dehumanize. He's deprogrammed himself or those demons in him have deprogrammed him from seeing people in the way that they should be seen. So what he does is he'll look at that woman and he'll dehumanize her. He'll look at her as nothing but an object that's prone to evil. He'll look at her as a person who's going to follow a pattern. You know, he thinks that every woman has a pattern. He thinks that, oh, she's just going to go get with a guy and she's going to go be a whore. And she's going to go sleep around because that's probably what his mom did. So he'll look at her as a person or object. He'll look at her as not being human. But then what ends up happening is he has that best friend. And that best friend happens to be female, but he didn't get a chance to dehumanize her. He got around her at first and maybe he was romantically interested in her or maybe there was no romantic interest at all, but he got around her and she started being open and honest with him. She started telling him, Hey, look, you know, so I'm talking to, and we're going to make up a name here. I'm talking to this guy named Peter and Peter is really nice. Like Peter did this and he'll start seeing her as a human because he'll see that she's actually being faithful to Peter and she's shooting down guys because she's opening up to him and she's getting advice from him. He'll see her as a human being. He'll see her outside of the category of women and he'll say to her, you're not like most women. Or in a lot of cases, he won't even identify her as a woman because he has such a hatred and such a frustration with women. All the same, he has a desire to have a woman. So he thinks that in order to have a woman, he needs to beat her. He needs to hurt her. He needs to control her. He needs to watch her. He needs to manipulate her. He thinks that he needs to do all of those things in order to have the best parts of a woman without having what he feels like she's prone to do. And at the same time, the issue is he starts to get addicted to that power that he has over that woman. This is why I warn women 
that you never go into an abusive relationship, of course, but if you get into a relationship and a guy starts showing, showing signs of being, you know, an abuser, first and foremost, you need to get out of it. But if you don't get out of it immediately, because I do know how we have a tendency to lie to ourselves. If you don't get out of that relationship immediately, what you need to do is you need to make sure that you stand your ground with him. Now, I understand that we ought to submit to our husbands, but there's a difference between submission and being passive. You have to stand your ground with him, meaning, let's say he comes in and he says, um, didn't I tell you to clean up this stuff off the floor? Get up and get this stuff off the floor. You don't get up and get anything off the floor. You let him know, like, listen, I don't know who you're talking to. Pick it up off the floor yourself. Now, this may get him to, you know, overreact and start acting crazy because, believe it or not, he's actually starting to train you. But the issue with um, an abuser is he starts getting addicted to the power. The power that he has over the woman is like a drug. And like I said, guys, this goes the same way. But when you're dealing with an abusive person, a person who has an addictive person, uh, an abusive personality, and a, is a demonic personality, of course, that person becomes addicted to controlling the other person. It becomes this thing where this man, at one point, he needed a reason to hit you. At one point, he needed a reason to come against you. But all of a sudden, he'll just make up something in his head because he'd go out and he had a bad day at work and you know they made him feel like less than a man somebody actually confronted him and he was too much of a coward to stand up to that guy he couldn't do anything about it so he wants to take out his frustration somewhere so this guy will actually sit up at his job and fantasize about coming home and what he's going to do to you this is the reality of an abuser it's not love he will sit back and think about when I go home, I'm going to knock her out. And he'll even remind himself of something you did or said. And what he's trying to do is get his frustration out. He'll come home and let's say, for example, you're in there, you're cooking. And you're saying, hey, babe, I'm cooking this and I'm cooking that. And he walks through there and his attitude is bad. And you're just like, hey, what's wrong with you? He says nothing. And then he comes back and he'll hold, for example, a pair of pants of his up. Hey, what happened to my pants? And you're like, oh, um, remember, like two weeks ago, I told you it got some bleach on him and he tosses them at you. And you're like, why did you toss that? And the next thing you know, he's charging at you. He, you know, he waits for you to start responding. He needs you to come up because he needs to get the, the argument started. And then all of a sudden he comes over there and he starts punching you. This person wanted to hit you before he even pulled into the driveway. It was already in his heart to do. It was already in his mind to do because he was a coward. He didn't know how to take out his frustration on the other person. However, he does have the spirit of vengeance, but he's too afraid to take vengeance on the person who did something to him. He's too afraid of the man, but he comes home and he takes it out on you. After he has kind of, and I hate to say it this way, but he has relieved himself. He's done what he felt like he needed to do. He'll go up and, you know, go into another room or what have you, and he will relish in what he just did. He may even consider what he just did, but then it becomes part B. I need to go and try to make sure that she doesn't leave if he thinks that you're going to leave. How do I stop her from leaving? If you got a lot of fear and he sees it, his way to stop you from leaving is to scare you. If he noticed that even after he has hit on you, you don't have that much fear then what he's going to do is he's going to use romance to try to get you to stay. Either way, he's going to try to manipulate and control the situation. He'll come up into the room and then he'll say, hey, how are you feeling? He'll even bring you an ice pad and say, hey, my apologies. Um, I don't know what came over me. I had a really bad day at the office. You remember that manager I was telling you about? Well, he got in my face today. And then, you know, this happened and that happened. And I guess I just took it out on you. And he'll be a little bit honest with you. But the reality is he was planning that before he came home because he felt like his power had been taken from him. He needed to feel like he had power over something or someone and you happen to be at home. So guess what he's going to do? He's going to come in and take it out on you. And I do want to warn you because this is something that just got laid on my heart. I do want to warn you too, ladies, if you happen to be in an abusive relationship or with a man who sh um, shows signs of control and domination, please do not go out and get a pet. Please don't do this. I hate to see women do that when you know your guy is controlling when you know that guy has some issues and then all of a sudden you want to go get yourself a cat or a dog. You are actually giving him something to hurt. You're giving him something that he can kill or torture because this man is a tortured soul.
He feels good anytime he hurts something or he hurts someone. He may be too afraid to take you all the way to the brink of death, but that demon in him is actually training him to kill you. So every time he hits you, he takes it up a notch because that demon in him is saying, okay, okay, okay. The fear of him going to prison, the fear that he has of going to prison and becoming somebody's girlfriend is, is there. So I can't push him to completely take her life. So that demon keeps t telling him, every uh, after every attack like look he she survived that attack that demon tells him like look she survived that attack you could take it up a notch she survived that attack you could take it up a notch because a lot of times when you're dealing with an abuser they're kind of careful in the beginning because they're thinking well i don't want to bruise her i don't want to put her in the hospital i don't want her to die but then for example if he comes and he punches you and he notices that you get a little small scar and you're able to stand back up the next time he comes to hit you he's going to escalate he's going to punch you two times the next time it's going to be three times the enemy that's in him that demon that's in him is actually trying to push him over the edge to go ahead and get him to kill you devils like to kill as many people as possible they are there are demons of destruction out there so what the demon would want him to do is to take your life and then have him tossed away in prison or if he doesn't go to prison if he uh, manages to lie his way out of the situation then that devil wants to have him go and get into another relationship experience those same emotions and then that demon will start reminding him of the thrills he got from hitting you that demon will start reminding him of the great sex he felt like he was having after he'd beaten you. Because here's the thing, some abusers, most abusers are actually turned on by their abuse. They're turned on by it. And it does something to them if you're willingly, you know, some of them want to have power over the woman and they will beat her and then turn, uh, toss her and rape her. But then you have some that even after, you know, they've been rejected so much, even after they beat the woman, they'll go charm her. And they'll try to basically get her to sleep with him, get, sleep with them, because what they're trying to do is they want you to prove your love for him, prove that you still love me after what I did to you, prove. And they got turned on from hitting you. That's the reality. They got turned on. So now they come and they want to sleep with you because they don't want to waste that adrenaline rush. I hate to be honest with you like that, but that's the reality. They don't want to waste that adrenaline rush that they just experienced. They had an adrenaline rush and they experienced this, you know, all these heightened emotions and everything. Everything seems surreal and they're having what feels like an out of body experience. Then everything in their body is working. The blood is flowing through their body and they look over at you and decide, okay, I want to sleep with her now. This would be the great finale to what just happened. And if you sleep with them, in most cases, and you know, any woman who's been abused will know that if you sleep with them, what the abuser is going to do is sit back and say all of the right things. They're going to charm you. They're going to sit back and say, I love you so much. I'm so sorry for what I did to you. They may even start crying and say, if they look at your face and see um, an abuse mark, uh, you, if they see like a black eye or a scar, they'll even start crying. It's just a manipulation. It's not the person actually feeling bad. He's a manipulative soul. He's a tortured soul. He's a person who likes to inflict harm on another person. And at the same time, he likes to act. He likes the feel of the moment. He likes how it feels to see you going from one place to the other. He likes how, how it feels to, you know, play these different roles and get your reaction in those roles. He becomes like an, a really great actor in that relationship. He'll come in and he'll say, hey, I love you so much. And I was praying last night. This is an act of his. This is something that he's trying to see. Am I that smart? Because most of the time when you're dealing with an abuser, you're dealing with a person who's narcissistic. And they feel really good about being intelligent. It makes them feel superior. So they'll come to you and they'll start talking. And they're trying to see if their words are actually working on you. And he'll sit back and he'll say, um, I thought about what you said yesterday. And you're right. I do need to go get help. And I'm going to get help because I love you. I want to keep our family together. I don't want to lose you. And I'm going to tell you, when you're dealing with the woman or the person who's on the other end of the abuse, the person sits back and they want to believe it because in most cases, they either love the person or they've made an idol out of the person. They got fantasies in their mind and the abuser has been playing into their fantasy. The abuser keeps trying to tell them, basically, I'm going to give you what you want. But I'm going to tell you something I've learned about an abuser. An abuser will oftentimes show you 
a point that you want to get to, they will learn what your fantasy is and they'll keep offering it to you and taking it back, but they'll never let you fulfill that fantasy. They will keep offering it to you. They'll even give you previews of what life could be like if they were sane. They will give you previews of what life would be like if they didn't have those demons. You know, I, I tell you, I was married twice and one of the guys I was married to, he was abusive. And one thing I found about an abusive man is that they're oftentimes very, very, very romantic. They'll do wonderful things for you. They'll do great things because they are always playing different roles. They are always trying to live in each moment. Most of the times their sexual deviance is something about the abuse that turns them on. They're always trying to explore different areas. So when you're dealing with an abuser, he may romance you and treat you like a queen, take you out to eat, come here and run you a bubble bath blindfold you like candles all over the house put slow music on slow dance with you and treat you like a queen for a couple of days but then again he'll snatch the plug on it because he doesn't want you to feel good about yourself he doesn't want you to look at yourself and say man look at what i got i'm a woman he doesn't want you to feel too good about yourself i mean he likes looking at you and seeing that he has um, put a smile on your face from time to time especially when he's happy that's one thing i've learned about abuser too is he wants you to feel how he feels at any given moment if he is happy if he had a uh, promotion on his job he got a compliment or, or something like that something really good happened he'll come home and he'll give you the best day of your life he'll come in and he'll be like put on some clothes baby um, go take your bath and put on some clothes because I'm about to take you out. I got some good news for you. And he'll have you all excited and you run into the bathroom and you take your shower, you put on your clothes, you're trying to look good and you're like, what happened? And he's like, I'm going to tell you, come on. And he gets you excited and then he takes you out to eat and he tells you and he's holding your hand. He takes you to the store. He'll buy you an outfit and he's holding your hand everywhere. It's, this is the moment that you've been waiting for. This is the moment that you've always wanted. This is the moment that you've been praying for. And you're walking with this guy and everything's starting to seem like it's looking up. And he sits back and he talks to you and he tells you, I got the promotion at work. And you're like, what? He said, I got the promotion. And you're sitting back and you're trying to utilize that moment to speak good into him, to get him to understand how much you love him. Baby, I knew you could do it. Baby, I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. Baby, I thank God. And he's just sitting there and he, he's eating it up because he's happy. But then he comes back and let's say, for example, he was up for promotion. And he finds out somebody else has gotten a promotion. He comes back the next day and now it's time to punish you. Now it's time to teach you a lesson. But there's a demonic side to the abuse of, as well. Of course, we know that the demonic side is demons like having control over people. That's the reality. Demons like having power over people. And whenever it gets into a person, an abuser, what it does is, of course, it likes to inhabit the soulless realm um, if the person is saved. But what it'll do is it attaches itself to his emotions and it gives him these different experiences like he experiences good feelings whenever he is doing whatever that demon wants him to do and at the same time he feels drained sad and tired whenever he's not obeying that demon so what happens is the demon rewards him for condescending you speaking word curses over you cursing you out tearing you down the demon rewards him for that but then that demon tells him hey look I think she's starting to get tired. You need to go in there and talk to her. I'll give you the words to say. Now, he doesn't um, audibly hear a demon telling him that these are just coming in the form of thoughts in his mind. He just thinks, well, he's sitting in a room. His you know, heart's still racing. He didn't just got through um, beating on his woman. And he's sitting up in the other room and his heart's racing. And he's you know, thinking about what just happened. And he had the equivalent, and I hate to go there. He had the equivalent of an orgasm by doing it because it's something he feels when he's doing it. And then all of a sudden he is back down to earth and he says, I better go in here and talk to her because, you know, she told me the last time if I hit her again, she was going to leave. And I think I've lost her. And then he'll go up in there and he'll try to do damage control. He'll go in there and he'll say, Hey, look, I'm so sorry for hitting you. You know, you pushed me. He'll try to give you some of the blame or all of the blame. You did this and you did that. He will try to shift the blame. If that doesn't work, then he'll take the blame. And it's false humility. He'll take the blame and say, I'm so sorry, baby. I need help. But if he thinks that he can shift some of the blame to you because that right there helps him to 
you know, continue to live in the power that he's feeling. He doesn't want to shift the blame to himself because in a way he feels like he's empowering you. This thing is all about power. It's all about control. It's about domination. So if he feels like he can shift the blame to you, he will. He will say, for example, I came into the house and I wasn't even bothering you. I walked into the room. I told you I didn't feel like fighting. You the one came in the room running your mouth. Hey, guess what? In every argument or any relationship, you're going to have arguments. But to him, he justifies hitting you using it. And the more narcissistic he is, the crazier he's going to talk. You know, whenever you're dealing with somebody that's a huge narcissist, then a lot of times they're going to try to justify it and they're going to say, I could have hit you harder, but I was trying to have mercy on you because I was about to pick up that vacuum cleaner and hit you across your back with it. But then I thought about it. I don't want to hurt you, but I'm trying to get you to understand. Leave me alone. So this is this man sitting back trying to train you. He's trying to teach you how to behave. It's the same thing that people do to an animal. Sit, stand, get up and all this other stuff. But whenever you're dealing with an abuser, an abuser wants to train a human being, human being aren't easily trained so an abuser is going to use uh, physical abuse and he will use manipulation and emotional abuse against you it, one thing he does is he wants to find your weaknesses and then he threatens to give you everything you're afraid of having like if you're afraid of losing him he will use that he'll keep um, threatening to leave he'll say I'm getting real tired of this he'll say things like you know what I've already clocked out of this relationship I really don't care no more. You know, I just feel like my body's here, but my heart's not here. He'll even um, start bragging on his ex-girlfriends. He'll do things like that because what he's trying to do is to get you to finally relinquish your control. For you, for you to finally say, hey, look, what, else, what do you want me to do? How do I win you? And you can't win him. He's not for sale. The thing that you're dealing with is a person who has a demon in him. And they've allowed that demonic personality to kind of graft itself into their own personality. That demon has showed them this big picture, this imagination of what they can have or what that demon says that they can have if they continue to follow this path that they're on. And they continue to pursue that path. They continue to go forth on that path because they want to believe that at some point, and here's the thing, the abuser wants to believe that at some point he'll come home from work. And let's say you come home from work. And you're going to go do everything that he thinks that a wife should do. You're going to get up and you're going to go in there and you're going to cook. You ain't going to question him. You're not going to argue with him. You're going to give him everything that he wants. You're going to make him feel good about himself when he has an emotional episode. You're going to know how to handle him. Everything to the abuser is about me, me, me. I will satisfy you once you give me, me, me what I want. I will give you the desires of your heart once you give me what I want. But what they don't realize is that there is no such thing as getting what you want from another human being. And we see this where a lot of women have tried. You have a woman who has a broken spirit and she actually starts to do everything that man wants her to do. She'll try to make sure she's up early and she'll cook breakfast for him. She'll try not to argue with him regardless of what he says. If he says, I'm going out, she'll try not to argue with him. And she'll try not to push his buttons. And when he's angry, she'll try to find some type of way to pacify him. She does everything that he wants, but it's never going to be enough because what's on the inside of him wants to see blood. What's on the inside of him wants him to kill her. And you got to understand that the Bible says for a husband to treat a wife as he treats himself. Well, when you're dealing with an abusive personality, most of the time they are tormenting themselves from the inside. So what they do is they torment their wives from the outside. So he starts to, you know, when the woman comes home from work and he comes home from work, he's already thinking in his head, what type of day is going to be? Am I going to treat her good today? Are we going to have a good day? Or are we going to have a really bad day for him? You got to understand too, that a, a bad day for you is a good day for him. And that's the hard part is that when he comes home from work and he makes it up in his mind, I want an adrenaline rushed orgasm. I want to have an experience while I feel empowered. I want to feel, you know, he makes it up in his heart and his mind. This is what he wants. Then he comes into the house and he knows how to get it. And then he'll find some kind of way or some reason, some justification to go ahead and start laying, layering the foundation for the attack with you. It, a lot of times it'll be something you did in the past. If you're not presently doing anything, or it's going to be something that you 
just did they'll sit back and wait on you especially if they know that for example you got a mouth you have a tendency to have an attitude you have a tendency to complain you have a tendency to get calls from your friend every day they'll say well okay i'm gonna wait for such and such to call her because she call her every day and then i'm gonna complain about that person when you're dealing with an abusive personality that person is I mean, it's exciting him. It's something that's giving him, it's kind of rewarding him every time he takes out his frustration on the other person. Like I said, it's not a good thing to be in a relationship with somebody who has demons. Because a lot of women actually think that when a man comes to him and he's saying, I want to be with you. And he's got all these other options that he could have, but he chooses you. You think that, okay man he has some beautiful women after him he got some gorgeous ex-girlfriends like his ex-girlfriend we're gonna say keisha his ex-girlfriend keisha is gorgeous he could actually be with her but he is choosing me out of all of them and he'll make you feel like you know what i'm giving you a an opportunity i'm giving you a chance to prove yourself because i got options lady i can go out and get whatever i want he won't say those words with his mouth but he'll imply them so what he'll do is He'll make you feel like, you know, you won. Like, hey, out of all the women America could have chosen for me, I'm I'm forsaking it all. I'm choosing you. And then this woman, she feels like she's won a prize. And she gets excited and everything. But reality, he's saying, I could never hit Keisha. If I hit Keisha, Keisha will leave. If I hit Keisha, Keisha will smother me in my sleep. If I was with Toya, Toya would actually cut off my feet. She would treat me like the woman from the movie Misery. If I hit Tasha, Tasha would probably slit my throat. If I hit Maria, Maria, would, she definitely wouldn't tolerate it. And she got a lot of brothers. Her brothers would come after me. He knows who he can hit. But when he looks at you, he says, if I hit her, this woman has made an idol out of me. This woman wants me so bad. If I hit her, she's not going to leave. She's going to try to work the marriage out. She's going to try to stay. And then he'll choose you because, you know, like I said, he's not choosing you. To, to love and to honor and to protect, he's choosing you to hit. He's choosing you to abuse. I always try to tell women, I have to warn women because sometimes women get flattered. He chose me. He chose me. What does that mean? You gotta, it depends on a person. He chose me. It depends on a person. It depends on what that person wants. When he chose you, what did he choose you for? Did he choose you to love you, to protect you, to honor you, to provide for you, to pray for you, to cover you, to be your husband? Or did he choose you to be the woman that he was going to hit on and cheat on and uh, mishandle, mistreat. Did he choose you for that? Because if that's what he chose you for, then actually you didn't win. I always warn women that, you know, whenever you get a guy like that, if you got two women pl um, playing tug of war with a guy like that, the winner is actually the loser. It's not going to be this thing where um, she walks away. And I've seen it happen where you have these women and they're fighting over this no good guy. And they're just, you know, acting silly and what have you. And this guy, they're sitting there playing tug of war. And then one of them loses the war. Well, actually, she she won, but she doesn't realize it. But she loses or she walks away. And the person who thinks she's a winner is so deceived that she's walking and she got her head up and she's bragging and she's boasting. And she's, you know, throwing her hips from side to side. Like, yeah, yeah, I got him. I'm the one he chose. I'm the one that, you know, I'm the better woman. I'm this and I'm that. And then when he gets her home, then he utilizes those opportunities to show her what he chose her for. He chose her to cheat on. He chose her to hit on. He chose her to have his children because children and him are nothing. He doesn't see children as um, beautiful representations of himself that he wants to um, nurture, birth, and give wisdom to. He doesn't see children like that. He sees children as nothing but opportunities to hold you down, to make sure you can't go nowhere, to lock himself into you for life. That's it. A man can sit up and marry a woman that he does not love. And whenever you're dealing with an abuser, most of the time, they're not going to marry somebody that they love and respect. They're going to marry somebody that they have dehumanized, that they don't see as human. They're going to marry somebody that, and they can actually have a conversation with you, do things for you, do things with you. But at the same time, they don't really see you as human. But like I said, you can have that one girl who is the close friend that he has learned to see as human. And he'll have a lot of respect for her because he'll look at her like, you know what, you're the only woman left on earth who is not this way or that way. So he'll get around her and he'll actually be protective of her. And that will be the woman that he really, really wants in his life. That'll be the woman that, despite it all, he will think that if I got with her, I would be a better man because I know her and she knows me. 
And I wouldn't treat her like these other guys treat her. You know, she keeps getting into these relationships and those relationships end. I would actually be better toward her, but that's not going to happen because once he gets romantically involved, his Eros love is broken. So when the filial love, he's okay. You know, as a friend, he's, he's good. He's not a problem. But once he is, has to give away his broken Eros love, he's going to revert back to his mindset, his abusive ways, because when he sees women, the way he sees women on a romantic level is um, warped, is sick, is psychotic. He's a narcissist. So when he gets with her, for example, if he gets with the best friend, then what's going to end up happening is he'll start seeing her on a romantic side. And at first he'll try to do his best with her, but then he'll start, you know, going back through the patterns with her, start back abusing her. And he'll start justifying the abuse for, you know, saying that she did something. So anyhow, what do you do when you're being abused? What do you do? First and foremost, I got to be honest with you. You got to tell yourself the truth. You are being abused. When I was in an abusive marriage, I lied to myself. I said, um, this is an abuse. This is fighting. That was the way I saw it. And I think it was because I watched my parents fight when I was growing up. Actually, they didn't fight. It was more so my mom. My dad didn't believe in hitting women back. But I watched my mom. So, And then I grew up in a lot of hoods, a lot of neighborhoods where you would see people out in the street fighting all the time, men and women. And sometimes the woman got the best of the man. Sometimes you would see women slamming guys. So I didn't see it as abuse. And it, it's crazy though, but I would see, like if you said abuse, a woman was being abused, I would think about some old passive, sweet, scary woman. And most of the time, a non-black woman who was getting hit and knocked out and she was curling up in a corner and putting her hands over her head because the areas I grew up in were predominantly black. And most of the time when I saw blacks fighting, I saw the woman coming out and she can be the aggressor or she could be stronger than the guy. Or even if he won, she gave him a fight. You know, she, she put up a really good fight. So it was hard for me to see myself as being an abuse, abuse victim. It was really hard for me to convince myself that I was being abused. I thought we were just fighting, even though I got to the point where I wasn't fighting back. I thought we were just fighting, even though, you know, I got to the point that was so many times where I was worried about my life. I was worried that, okay, this may be it. This may be the day that he takes my life. Cause I knew it was coming. If I didn't get out, I had to be honest with myself. I knew it was coming. If I didn't get out of that marriage, However, I sat back and I convinced myself that, no, nah, you know, um, it's just a fight. Um, he'll calm down. And a lot of times I would have momentary, I would have the temporary sanity where I say, I got to get away from this guy. And during my times of temporary sanity, I would reach out. It was only two people who knew what I was going through. I didn't tell my mom for two years and I had a really close friend and I used to tell her and ironically enough, she had um, come from an, a, a household of domestic abuse. Her dad had taken her mom's life when she was younger. So, of course, she was passionate about getting me to leave. She was pushing and yelling and screaming and trying to get me to leave. But I didn't realize I was being abused. And that was the thing that made me say. I didn't realize I was being abused. I thought we were just fighting. An abuser always has a way to convince you that it's your own fault. And they're really good at it. They will find something that you did that you shouldn't have done. Because in an argument, both people are going to... Um, most times do something they shouldn't have done or say something they shouldn't have said. Well, an abuser will key in on one word that comes out of your mouth or one thing that you have done and they will say, Hey, that was the trigger. You know, when you said that, that hurt me to the core. When you did this, that hurt me to the core. And they'll use that as a justification to do what they were going to do anyway. They will use, and sometimes when they have nothing to use, they'll find something silly to say, you know, um, well, when you said that you loved me and that you weren't going to argue with me something on the inside of me kind of went off because i kind of felt like you know there you go again everybody who say they love me hurt me and walk away from me and i i guess i just blanked out he wanted to hit you anyway i got to put that out there for you when i was going through that i convinced myself that i wasn't being abused i convinced myself it wasn't until the last year of our marriage that I had to come face to face with the fact that I was being abused. And that was because the abuse had started escalating greatly. And it had gotten to the point where, and I don't know if I've ever testified, but it got to the point where one particular day he took a belt and beat me with it. And that, I think that was the day when I actually stood there and realized it was two incidents. Well, actually three incidents 
that I could actually, I could say that I came to the realization that I was being abused. It was three incidents where I finally said, okay, he's not just, um, yelling at me. He's not just, this isn't a fight anymore. This is actual abuse because it was that incident with the belt and we had gotten into an argument and I was holding the home phone and I was standing in the door. And he had a belt in his hand because he was threatening his son with the belt. But I was standing in the door and I got mad at him and I tossed the phone, but I didn't toss it in his direction. I tossed it in the opposite direction. You know, I was standing in the door and I tossed it, not in the room, but outside the room. But he was mad that I had broken the phone. So the next thing I know, I, I remember turning around and I saw him having his hand drawn back, running toward me with that belt. And then he started striking me with the belt. And I started going backwards and putting my hands up trying to defend myself. Now, here's the thing. I never thought in a million years I would be the victim of abuse. And that was why it was so hard for me to even put it in my head that I was being abused. But when we got to the stairs, we had a two-story home. I remember he started, it looked like he started hitting me harder and harder. And he was hitting my arms because I had my arms blocking my face. But he started hitting me harder and harder with so much rage in it or what have you. But I, I wouldn't uh, let my hands down and at the same time I started trying to brace myself to keep me from falling but I could tell he wanted me to fall and of course I called the police and we had um, the police out there with um, a little cricket and they made an excuse they said well you know um, he has a scratch on his neck and I was like yeah that's probably from me defending myself or I don't know what happened to his neck but they said well okay yeah but here's the thing if you press charges on him he can press charges on you and a lot of different cities and state a lot of police officers they actually get frustrated with the process they get tired of dealing with it and I can understand why but at the same time you know um, they end up getting reprimanded I think some of them even got fired for that incident and other incidents with women where they weren't taking any reports and it was their way of trying to get around filing a police report because they had already judged the situation. They already made up their mind. Well, she's not going to do anything but return to him anyway. I don't want to do this ton of paperwork, so I'm not going to fill out a report. I'm just going to let him know that he has rights to have her arrested because we see a scratch. He didn't even know he had a scratch on his neck. And, you know, they were like, well, you got he has a scratch on his neck. And, you know, there were two other incidents, but it was several incidents. It was actually a lot of abuse, but there were several incidents in that last year that brought to me that I had, I couldn't, I couldn't lie to myself anymore. I had to tell myself that I was actually being abused. I think the belt was the worst incident. And then there was another incident where, um, we were out in the street. He attacked me, charged me, and he was dragging me in the street. And I mean, it's like everybody in that neighborhood came outside and watched me get dragged and I had burns on my back from being dragged in the street. So the thing was, I think it was during that time that I started telling myself the truth. It was during that time when I said, you're actually in an abusive relationship. It was during that time when I said, you got to get up out of this. And it was during that time when I started um, being more open about what I was going through. I started talking more because you can always tell when a woman is on her way out or a guy is on his way out. They actually start talking more, especially if they were secretive in the beginning. They start talking more. I started reaching out and I started telling my mom and I hated telling her, but I didn't have contact with that many people. And at the same time, I had some relatives I didn't want to call because I wanted to make sure that. I was completely out of the relationship, you know, before I called relatives because I had a couple of male relatives that I was really close to. And I knew if I said anything, I already knew that it wasn't going to be um, a discussion. They would have came to my house, probably kicked the door in, a knock came in and they would have ended up with a police record on my behalf. And I didn't want that to happen. I didn't want them to end up going to jail, especially, you know, I had to think about, well, OK, what if they go to jail and. He ends up charming me and I end up staying with him. I actually told myself the truth. Unlike a lot of women who are abused, I told myself the truth. I don't want them to get involved because I don't want to end up staying with him when they expect me to leave after they've tried to defend me. And at the same time, you know, when we have to go to court and I have to testify on their behalf, of course, I'm not going to sit up here and lie and say, that they were wrong. I'll say they were trying to defend me, but it would have put me in a really bad situation. So the thing was, I was um, keeping my mouth closed and I told my mom about what was going on. And, you know, it was kind of hard because I put a lot of pressure on her. It really overwhelmed her. And I told um, my closest friend what was going on. As a matter of fact, she had to see me many times where 
um, when I had left the house because of the abuse. Most of the times it was the middle of the night I was showing up at her house and what have you. I actually went to her house the after the belt incident and I had welts all over my arms from the belt. And I remember that was the day where she just went uh, the most berserk. She just like, look, Tiff, you got to leave. So you, and you can't keep staying. This man is going to kill you. And I think I, that day was when that, those words came out of my mouth. I know. I knew that if I didn't leave, I was going to lose my life. I knew. But at the same time, when you're dealing with abuse, people think that it's easy for the abuse victim to leave. People think that it's as simple as, okay, you see he's an abusive man. He's a cheater. You see he's doing all these other things. So pack your stuff and leave. Oh, you know what? Don't even pack your stuff. Just leave. They think it's easy, but you're dealing with somebody who's in a soul tie, somebody who's under a spell. You're dealing with somebody who's under um, witchcraft. This person has been, you know, believing in believing what that person's told him. Because see, here's the thing. Like I said, the abuser, he has times where he's calm and loving and sweet. And he will present every desire of your heart. He acts just like Satan. He will present every desire of your heart to you. This man will pick you up and take you, for example, on a nice trip to wherever it is that you've been dreaming to go. He'll take you on that trip, that trip and treat you like a princess, love on you, kiss on you, hold your hand. He will actually sit back and try to get you so locked into that relationship that, that you can't leave. That's the, the trick of the abuser. The abuser's game is to get you secure in a relationship, get you sturdy to the point where he doesn't feel like you're going to um, move. It's kind of like nailing you down, putting you in a chair and nailing you down to the floor. And that way, once he feels like he has you nailed down, he can start hitting again. He can start, you know, punching you and everything. And he doesn't have to worry about the chair topping over. And at the same time, when he starts noticing that the chair is starting to come loose, when it looks like you might be getting up and walking away, then he has to do something else to charm you into staying. He has to nail you down again. And ladies, I have to be honest with you, because if I don't tell this truth, that a lot of women are going to lose their lives. I'm praying that this audio will help to save the life of one woman, at least that is the victim of abuse. You got to understand that the man does not love you. It's not love that makes him do that. He does that because he has demons in him and he desires the control. See, a lot of times when you're dealing with women who have those type of husbands, then they say, okay, I just need to get him to a pastor, somebody who can cast out demons. They think that that's the solution to the problem. If I can get him somewhere, because he's a really good guy. I mean, seriously, we talked. And that's the, like I said, that's their favorite thing to say is we talked. We, I mean, he, he's a really good guy. Um, he's got so much potential. Yeah, you are married to his potential. But at the same time, you're being beat up by his reality. His reality is what's manifesting in your life. So they'll sit back and constantly say, we talked, we talked. And they say, well, do you know somebody who cast out demons? Because I'm going to try to get him there. That man has got to want to be free. Nine times out of ten, he doesn't want to be free. Because if he wanted to be free, he would have looked himself. If he wanted to be free, he would go searching for help himself. I don't care how many brochures he's bought home. Most of the time when you're dealing with somebody like that, they'll go into an office and they'll get some brochures or they'll print one off online or they'll even leave the computer on a website so that you can see it. You'll get home. Let's say, for example, he didn't beat the brakes off of you yesterday and you come downstairs and you come home from work and you look at your computer. You, you know, you hit the key, cut it on. And then all of a sudden the screen comes up talking about abuse or what have you. And then you get, you get flattered because you think he's looking for help. He's not. He left that screen up for a purpose. He left that screen up for a reason. A man who's genuinely looking for help is not going to be grabbing brochures and checking out websites. What he's going to do, if he checks out the website, he'll close it. He'll get up the next day and he'll go on his own. He'll keep going. He's going to go and he's going to try to get help. That's the person who actually wants help. But when you're dealing with somebody who doesn't want help, they're going to try to make you think that they're going to get some help. That, that helps them to keep you secure so that you don't get up and leave anytime soon. Because their thing is, I need to lock her down. I need to nail that seat down a little bit more. Well, I warn women, don't give a person power over you. What ends up happening, and I've seen this happen a lot of times, where the woman allows this man to have power. He gets addicted to the power. The woman gets to the point where she wakes up one day and she decides, hey, I don't want to be here no more. I don't want to keep getting abused. I don't want to do this. And then the abuser, because he's dehumanized her, he's convinced himself that she is his property. He tries to talk her out of leaving. So he'll come to her and he'll cry and he'll say, 
baby, I love you so much. You, you're like my breath. You're my everything, baby. I couldn't, I couldn't, I don't know what I would do without you. And the kids, honestly, when he does that, anytime an abuser humbles himself, even though it's false humility, he feels like I'm giving you the ultimate. I'm giving you something greater than money. I'm giving you something greater than anything you could have asked for. So as of right now, you better not leave me because I just actually humbled myself. So he comes in and he says, baby, don't leave. Baby, I'm so sorry, baby. I know I've done some stuff. I love you. I love the kids. I don't want to see you gone. I'm going to get help. I'm going to do this. He has humbled himself. Like I said, in most cases, you're dealing with false humility. But then again, you'll have somebody who humbles themselves temporarily just so that they can get you to stay. Or they'll convince themselves that, hey, I'm going to get some help. He will sit there. But if you, if that woman decides, hey, I'm still going to leave because I've heard this talk before. We've had this discussion before and you are still doing the same thing. Then what the abuser takes in his head is she got somebody else. After all of what I just said to her and she still don't want to stay with me, she got somebody else. Ain't nobody else going to enjoy her. I'm going to take her life. I'll kill her. That's the heart of an abuser. And I'm going to be honest with you, ladies. I got to come at you and I got to come at you in love. Those of you who have children who are in abusive relationship, it doesn't matter if the man is the father of the children. The thing is, you don't have the right to grab a microphone and stand in front of the television set crying if this man takes your child and you were sitting back there in a relationship with him and you didn't leave. You didn't even want to protect your child. I've told this to um, a lady that was in an abusive relationship. Don't even bother grabbing the microphone. Don't even bother standing in front of a camera and crying and talking about something. He killed my baby. He killed my baby. Being a mother starts when the child is alive, when the child has been conceived. Being a good mother starts when the child has been conceived. Being a mother doesn't start after the death of your child, after your child has been hurt molested, raped, permanently wounded, or worse, killed. That is not when being a mother starts. And I hate to have to come at women like this, but this is going to save some child's life. I dare. And I tell, you know, I, I told this woman, I said, look, if I see you on TV talking about he killed my baby, you might as well get ready for another camera coming my way. No, she is an accessory to the death of her child. Because she wanted that man so much that basically what she did was she offered up her child because that's what women do. Whenever you make an idol out of a man, you will offer up whatever it is that you have in order to keep that man, even if it's his own child. You will offer up that child knowing good and well that that dude crazy, knowing good and well that he's going to hurt that baby at some point. But you keep on trying to prove your love for him and you will put your child at risk. And I tell you, I have to come at you ladies, if you got children and you're in an abusive relationship, and you don't want to leave that man, you've already chosen that man over your children. So the best thing for you to do is to take that child and give it to a relative. Take that child and give it to somebody in your family who will love and protect that child. Don't, put that, don't expose that child to that abuse just because you made an idol out of that man. Don't make that baby have to suffer through the craziness of that dude. A lot of children right now are dead or have been raped or permanently wounded because their mama wanted that man more than she wanted the child and you can't tell her nothing she'll say no i love my baby i'll do anything for my baby i'll you know i would even die for my baby it's a lie it's a lie she will let her baby die for her you know and the thing is if you're dealing with an abusive situation if the guy was to for example he got upset and he took his rage out on the child and the child the child passed away that type of mom a lot of times after she the guy sat there and he started working on her head again he's like Baby, baby, I'm so sorry, baby. I didn't even try to do that, baby. I don't even, I got so, I'm going to get some help, baby. No, no, no. He, he will convince her to tell the police some little crazy cocky mammy story about what happened to the child. No, he came in the room and he bumped this and all that other stuff. And she'll think that, okay, finally, he's offering me what I want. Finally, he's saying that, okay, if we get through this and we, um, say to the child, you know, I knocked the crib over by accident or something, or I, you know, let's say the child's a little bit older. Um, I, you know, he was playing with this or something happened or she was playing with that or something happened. Then he makes her think that if we get through this situation here, if you help me to not go to jail, cause he's a narcissist. If you help me to get past this situation here, I'm going to be the man that you want. We're going to have more kids. 
We're going to have more kids. I'm going to be the man you want. I know it's a hard time. I'm grieving too. And then he will even make you feel like he's grieving more than you. The guilt is eating him up. He will make you work. A grieving mother will have to actually jump up and help him out while he's grieving. Because his grief, even though it's fake, you know, he does have some guilt or what have you. But it's mostly fear of going to jail. So she will have to jump up off of her bed and go and wrap her arms around him because he's sitting back and he's trying to act like he's thinking about taking his life and he'll try to act like the grief is eating him up so badly. And he'll watch her and, you know, in his mind, he knows he feels nothing, but he'll watch her, you know, work and he'll make her work even during her stages of grieving. A lot of people don't realize that when you're dealing with abuse, you're dealing with a lot of layers. You're dealing with a person. The abuser is hurt, wounded. They've been rejected, betrayed. They've gone through a lot of things. But here's the reality. Most of us have done that, but we've taken different paths. You know, we all take our own path. But most of the time when you're dealing with an abuser, they will justify their abuse. They'll say, well, you don't understand the pain I went through. You don't understand that my mama wasn't there. My daddy wasn't there. This is what happened to me. You know, um, that person did this or that person did that. They will try to justify being the way that they are. And when they start justifying it, it's because they really don't want to be set free from it. Because they're saying, well, leave me alone. It, I have a different story. I got a story to tell. See, here's my story. My mom, she was like this. My dad was like this. My grandpa, my grandparents were like this. Um, my girlfriends, they dogged me out. Everybody hurt me. Everybody betrayed me. Everybody is that victim. Me, me, I, I, I. Pride. Most of the time when you're dealing with an abuser, especially if they have um, any degree of intelligence, they're going to be very narcissistic. See, they, they love playing people. They love going out and being able to, you know, pretend um, I'm, I'm so hurt and I, I love you so much. They actually like playing people because when people bite into it, they walk away feeling like I'm so smart. Look at, I can just play these strings like it ain't nothing. A, a narcissist, let's say his wife leaves him, for example. And let's say she goes back to her parents' house. He will drive over to her parents' house with the intention of manipulating her parents. He will actually rehearse in the car. He will think in his head how he's going to act. He'll buy roses for them. He will plan his um, performance. He'll get around a family. And, you know, if he thinks the family is easily swayed, he'll get around a family and he'll come in and he'll start crying. But then he'll try to make them feel like, okay, can y'all talk to her too? Because, see, she did this to me or she did that to me. This is her problem and this is her fault. And if he doesn't think that's going to work, he'll go over there and he'll say, um, let's say to her father, he'll say, um, Mr. Smith, I really need help. Mr. Smith, I want help. I love your daughter so much and I never meant to hurt her. I, I have been having to try to deal with this. He will play. And, but then when he gets in his car, you know, if he feels like they said, well, come back tomorrow, we'll talk. We're going to talk to her and everything. And then if he gets in his car and leaves, he's not going to cry on his way home. He's going to uh, turn on his music and he's going to be sitting there feeling really good because he feels like he has successfully manipulated somebody, especially if the girl's dad is um, smart if her family is smart because it makes him feel that I have outwitted that person. I'm smarter than that person. So, you know, you think you see him pulling out from the driveway and he looks like he's tormented. He looks like he's sad, but only if you can see him up the highway. He's got his music on. He's sitting back rocking his head and smiling because it makes him feel good. It makes him feel smart. It makes him feel like I'm smarter than the average bear that, you know, I got around all these people. I done manipulated them. And then when he gets the woman to come home, of course, he goes through that stage of um, treating her good again, making her feel Welcome, making her feel at home because right now he's back to trying to secure the seat. He's nailing the seat down. And then once he gets that seat um, secure, then he says, okay, now it's time. I think I can hit her again. And a lot of times, you know, if she's left before, then he'll try to start back at the bottom from the abuse and then work his way back on up. So it may start off as um, he'll try to scare her, jump at her. And then he'll try, you know, I'm trying, see, and he'll ball his fist up and walk off and he'll say, see, I almost knocked you out, but I've been trying, I'm trying to do the right thing, but you keep pressing my buttons, you keep doing this. And really what he's trying to do is see, okay, uh, the threat of a hit, what are you going to do? He actually likes it when you flinch. He likes it because it makes him feel empowered. But then the next time he comes around, you know, he'll go ahead and jab you. And then he'll sit back and he'll say, um, for example, pick your glasses up off the floor. 
and he'll walk off and then, you know, he'll come and let's say he'll go off into the other room and then he'll come back in there, hand you a paper towel to wipe your face. And he'll say, um, and don't be called until my business either. See, he's testing out. I'm going to try the aggression role. I'm going to scare her. If that doesn't work, I'll try the emotional role. I'll come in and say, oh, I can't live without you. I don't know what to do. I love you so much. What am I going to do with, without you and all this other stuff? He will use. And if you got kids with him, he'll start picking up the child, walking around with the child and feeding the child, doing little things for the child. But what he's doing, actually, especially if he's still angry, he's actually using the child to threaten you. When you see him walking past you after he's hit you, when he's holding your child, he's trying to manipulate you. And at the same time, he wants to scare you. I got your baby in my hands. I can do something to him or her right now. I can hurt this baby right now. All you have to do is get up and try to pack up. You, you, I want you to try to pack your bag and watch what I do to this child. It, it, it's a scary thing. He will threaten a child without actually directly threatening a child. And the mother catches on and she just runs up beside him and tries to get, you know, give me my baby. And he says, my baby too. And he will pull the baby back. Get this my baby too. This is my child too. If the child is of walking age, then he'll snatch the child, my child too. And it could become a tug of war. But anyhow, like I said, mothers, if you put your child in that situation, if that man takes your baby's life or he does something to that baby, do not even grab a microphone. Don't stand in front of a camera and don't pretend that you're so hurt. It starts in motherhood. Motherhood starts before that child is born. The minute you realize that you are conceiving a child, it, things should change. You're supposed to say, okay, I can't put me as number one no more. I can't sit back and look at this man and say, I want to be with him so bad. Now you got a baby that needs to be protected. And that is the natural instinct of a mother to protect her child, even from the father. I had two Siberian Husky dogs. And um, my, I remember my female got pregnant. And this was some years ago, what have you. But my female dog got pregnant, and we had this two-story home, and we had this little hallway upstairs that nobody used. It connected two rooms, and one of the rooms um, was a room that we were rarely using. So we decided to shut the dog up in that hallway part so she can have area to roam in, and then her children wouldn't fall downstairs. But one of the things I noticed was that when she was a new mom, she didn't know how the male dog was going to react to her children. So he couldn't even come anywhere near that door. He couldn't, he couldn't come anywhere near. I remember any time we had the door open, if we were trying to let her come out, of course, we would take her out to use the bathroom or something. And she really didn't have peace. When she went out to use the bathroom, she's like, let's get this done quick. You know, she was just like, I got to get this done quick or what have you. So a lot of times what we would do is take the male out with her to use the bathroom so that she can have her peace. But she still wouldn't have too much of her peace because she would be worried about her children, even though we, of course, closed the door so that they can't come out into the hallway. But... What she would do, like he would be running upstairs and he runs up ahead of her. She would run up and attack him, even though he was almost two times bigger than her. She would run up and attack him. If he got too close to that door or if we opened that door and he was anywhere near that door, she would attack him. What she was doing was protecting her young. She was saying, I don't know how he's going to respond, even though he's the father. I don't know how he's going to respond to our children, but I need to protect. See, her instinct was these are not his children at that moment, these are my babies. I got to protect them. My, my order of business is to protect them. It was actually amazing watching her, how dominant and controlling she came, became. She went from being that passive, sweet little puppy dog to like, hey, look, I, I will split your head um, for coming near my children because she was afraid. I remember when the puppies came of age where they were old enough to be given to new homes and stuff. Um, we still had them in the house for a while and we started carrying them downstairs. And I remember she started letting him come. She started letting him have supervised visits with the puppies. Like she would sit there because the puppies by that time, they were up moving around. They can see and they were running around wagging their tails and they were little chunky things at that time. And she would just stand there and watch. And it was so funny to watch the supervised visitations that she was allowing him to have because she was trying to protect her children. And it was amazing watching him as well because he realized that they were children and they were fragile. So anytime he stood to his feet, when they saw how big he was, they would all take off running. So what he started doing was he would lay down on the floor and he would roll over on his back and they would all come run up and start wrestling him and everything. And she was fine with that. But when he stood to his feet, 
the puppies were scared her, and mama was standing her feet too because she's just like what you about to do what, what's going on you know we got a problem but the th the point is we can't let animals be more protective of their young than we are toward ours and that's the issue with today you got a lot of women who have made an idol out of the guys in their lives and they want that man so much that they're young are secondary they look at their child as well um hopefully this baby will help to strengthen our relationship that's all the child is the child you know it, it, it plays into my fantasy of having his baby it plays into my fantasy and hopefully this will strengthen our relationship but at the same time me you know getting out the way and leaving him alone with the child is me proving my point i trust you so in a sense like i said what the mother is doing is actually offering up her child as a living sacrifice you know she's hoping of course that the man doesn't go there and hurt her child but in reality every woman knows her husband's potential even if he has the potential to kill when i was married and i was in an abusive relationship i couldn't lie to myself i couldn't tell myself that he didn't have the potential to kill me I knew he did, and I knew that if I didn't get out, that nine times out of ten, that that choking wasn't going to stop. You know, it wasn't going to be this um, episode where he was choking me, and then all of a sudden he lets go. And I, I, I fall to the floor and gasp for air. And, you know, one time it's going to be, he's going to keep on choking, and he's going to keep on choking, and he's going to keep on choking. And then eventually when he drops me to the floor, I would be lifeless, or I would be um, on the verge of dying. And would he call the police and say, hey, my, my wife is on the uh, floor? No, because when you're dealing with somebody like that, it's at that moment, it's like they look at the woman, oh, uh -uh, I ain't finna go to jail. It's not about you. It's not, oh, I don't want you to die. Oh, my God, I love you so much. No, it's, I ain't going to jail. I'm not trying to go to prison. I'm not trying to spend my life in prison. So then it becomes, okay, what can I do? They'll try to perform CPR or do whatever they think is necessary to save your life. And if they do successfully save your life, they're going to remind you of it. If I wanted to kill you, I could have. You see, you know, that day I got down on my knees and did CPR on you. There are layers and layers and layers to abuse. And I can't go through it all in this one recording. There are layers and layers. But what I want to say to you is this. If you're in an abusive relationship, get out of it. That man is not in love with you. It's not a love thing. Yes, he may believe that he loves you. And a lot of times when you're dealing with an abuser, they actually do believe it. They say it. In some cases, when they say, I love you, they're actually being sincere. But they don't know what love is, so they're not actually giving you love. They are giving you what they think of as love. They're giving you what they think you deserve. You're a woman. A lot of cases when I've met male abusers, they've had issues with women. Their, their problem was some woman in their life hurt them or what have you. You're a woman. So they take out their frustration with her on you. And I know you're saying, well, okay, we just got to get the demons cast out and get him to see women differently. Listen, these are the type of things that a person has to go and do on their own. These are the type of things, like if somebody wants help, they'll go pursue help. You don't have to go and bring help to him. He'll go get help on his own. We live in a society in a time where help is not but a phone call away. If he wants help, he can go get help. He's not trying to get help because he doesn't want it. He actually likes the way that he is. Even though he may cry about it, even though he may uh, promise not to do it anymore, even though he may sit back and you know seem like he's kicking his own tail about it, it's not the truth. The reality is if he wanted help, he would get help. If he didn't want to be an abusive man, he would not hit you anymore. He will get control over himself, but the problem is he wants control over you. That is the issue. When you come face to face with that, and this is what I had to do. I had to come face to face with the truth. I had to tell myself, look, this man don't love me. This man is not, it, it's not a thing that he's hitting on me or he's doing what he's doing because he loves me or because I did something wrong. He's doing it because he like it. He's doing it because it does something to him. You know, it makes him feel good on the inside. It makes him feel powerful. It makes him feel like he's a man. And I had to tell myself the truth. And it was at the end. It was at the end of that marriage. I actually started. I stopped lying to myself. I stopped sitting back telling myself that, hey, this man loves me. This man is, you know, he just lost his temper. But he's a good guy. You know, when he's not mad, he's a good guy. I actually had to stop telling myself that. Was he nice? Yeah. Was he nice when he was um, calm and everything? Yeah. Was he, you know, a good guy? In so many ways, yeah. But was he an abuser? Yeah. Did he have the potential to kill? Yes. 
Now, I, can, I know you're saying every person has the potential to kill. But, yeah, he was more, most likely to succeed. If you want to do a yearbook, he was most likely to succeed. And if you got a guy who's hitting on you, he is going to have his face in that yearbook, too. Don't end up dying trying to prove your love to somebody. You know, the thing that you want to do is make sure that you give that love you give in that man. Give it to yourself. Start loving yourself and more than anything, start loving God. Start loving God all the more. And you make it up in your heart and your mind that I'm worth more than what I've accepted for myself. You settle for less. You put yourself on clearance. The devil may have convinced you that you're worthless. He may have convinced you that you don't know how to shut up. That's why that man hits you. You keep on starting trouble. Maybe if you hadn't done this or said this, this wouldn't have happened. You the one started all this. All of those are lies from the pit of hell. Some of the stuff you say to that man, guaranteed, it's not bad at all. It's something that we say when we all get mad. I'm tired. I'm going to leave. Leave me alone. Don't touch me. Get away from me. You know, these are things that we say when we're mad. That's how we act. And the same thing with guys. We're not um, perfect. We're human. So the thing is, these are things that um, are normal. But, of course, the abuser will always make you feel as if what you said is something that is beyond mean, beyond cruel, um, it's merciless, and it deserves the reaction he has. As a matter of fact, most of the time when you're dealing with an abuser, he's going to try to make you feel like the reaction was a lot lighter than the offense itself. Like, I could have did this, I should have did this, because that hurt me to the core, but that's why I left. A lot of times when you're dealing with abusers, ladies, the problem is that they're having an affair. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of times when you're dealing with an abuser, the problem is the, the guy is having an affair. And especially when you have an abuser that will hit you or start some kind of fight and leave. He's having an affair or he's trying to have an affair with somebody. I've seen cases where abusers will sit back and, you know, they'll tear their wives down and they'll be gone for two and three days. And the reality is I've even had a case where um, I heard a woman saying, okay, well, he better not be cheating on me. That's the one thing I'm not going to tolerate. But it's like, okay, but him doing the other stuff, him um, beating your tail is tolerable. You're saying that that's okay. You can deal with the abuse. But you're saying that if he cheats, that you can't deal with that. That's when you don't really truly love yourself. And that's what God wants to bring you to. He wants you um, to bring you to a place where you learn to love yourself. He wants to bring you to a place where you actually see yourself the way he sees you. God does not abuse you, and he doesn't want some man to come into your life or some woman for the guys to come into your life and abuse you. When you're dealing with an abuser, you're dealing with a murderer who just hasn't graduated yet. That's the reality. You're dealing with somebody who not only has the potential to take your life, but they are voted most likely to succeed at taking your life if you don't walk away. If you want to sit there and die to prove your love, then you can. But I'm going to tell you, you better rebuke the enemy and repent to God and tell God, I want you more than I want a man. Because I, I tell people this, and anytime I come across a woman who's in an abusive relationship, she starts having demonic, dark fantasies. Like I said, she is an insane and she has temporary bouts of sanity. But um, I've seen women who, they'll start having fantasies. You know, things that they feel like are going to change their God because they change. They've tried just about everything they could think of. But they'll have um, this moment of, it's still another moment of insanity, but they'll have this moment where they'll start fantasizing about him being at their funeral. And I've heard women say this, they'll start fantasizing about the man being at their funeral and crawling all over in their casket. And, you know, he's feeling the ultimate hurt now. He understands, I loved him, I was there for him, and now look at me. You know, they'll fantasize about being in the casket because you know he hit him too hard and he they think that that's going to make him say oh baby i'm so sorry i'm so sorry and they'll have those fantasies and then they have fantasies about okay well he gets up and leaves and i get so distraught and hurt and i'm riding around looking for him or i leave because something he did and then you know i have an accident and then he's at the uh, hospital over my bed and you know over my comatose body and he's begging they they get so desperate that they're actually willing to to offer their own lives up as a sacrifice to prove their point that in itself is demonic to prove a point to prove my love for you is real my love for you that's not even love that you're offering him that's obsession and it's adultery and i gotta tell you if you die having made a god out of a man you cannot expect god who is your second choice to open the doors of heaven and welcome you in 
And at the same time, don't think that that man is going to spend his life grieving you. Those fantasies are from the devil. Don't think that that man is going to be laying around talking about, man, she was the best woman I ever had. No, I'm going to tell you what he's going to do because he's a narcissist. He'll come to your funeral. He'll put on the show for everybody else because this becomes a thing. Well, let me prove my point to everybody. Let me see how good of an actor I am. Let me see how much smarter I am than the rest of them. He may even feel guilty and everything. And most of the time, his tears are going to be him fearing going to jail. He'll come there and he'll throw, put on this big old act and have them carrying him out and everything. He becomes the victim at your own funeral. He will sit there and play that role all the way. I mean, just play it to the T. And then... He'll get in his car knowing good and well he already got him another girlfriend. Before your body started cooling down, he already had another girlfriend. He got somebody that he can't wait to go see. And he can't go, wait to go and put on a performance for her. To come and act like your death has him so distraught and that he's such a good man because now he's working on her. Now he's starting to set the trap for her too. That's the reality of a narcissist. That's the reality of an abusive personality. If that's how you want to give your life, that's your choice. But I tell you, if you got children, do the humane thing, do the right thing, and go give those children to a relative. If, you, if you're not going to leave him, if you're going to stay with him, do the right thing and go give those children to a relative of yours, somebody that can love them greater than what you're giving them. Go give them to somebody who will protect them. Because at this moment, your child and your heart, even though you won't acknowledge it, is nothing but a human sacrifice. To be with that guy is to prove a point to him is to show him that I do love you. I am here for you. I am trying to give you the desires of your heart. You're just going to have to calm down and trust me. You're going to have to calm down. I had, um, and I'll say this lastly, I had an ex and, um, uh, thankfully I never got married to the guy, but I had an ex and I've told you the story that, um, he never got a chance to hit me, but he had an episode where he grabbed me up by an arm and threw me on the bed, and he went to screaming at the top of his lungs. He balled his fist up, and he drew his hand back, and he said, now get up. I, I dare you to get up. Get up out that bed. He said, I'm going to knock you out. Get out that bed. Come on, get off the bed. And I sat there, and I think I was, at, you know, about 20 years old, 21 years old back then, and I knew abuse wasn't right. I broke it off with him because of that, because I wasn't the type of woman who would take abuse. That was my thing. That was the way I thought about life. That was how I saw myself. I'm not a type of I'm not the type of woman to get hit on. So I sat there any other time, any other guy, I would have got up and been like, come on, hit me. Let's go ahead. We're going to go for it. You know, but that particular guy, I knew it was something about him. I knew don't get off this bed. This dude has some issues. So I sat there and I made it up in my mind. I need to get out of this house. It's over with between me and him. I need to get out of this house. I, I just need to find some type of way to get out of his house. Because if I don't get out, he's going to hurt me. If I don't get out, he's going to hurt me. And it's going to be a romantic event for him. It's going to be a sick, twisted little event. I got to get up out of here. And um, sure enough, you know, he was still standing there. And his stepdad came in and was like, hey, Tiff, you want me to call the police? And I said, yeah, but he didn't call the police. And I just sat there. And the whole time I'm th sitting there, my mind is racing with thoughts. How do I get up out of here? That window is bolted down. It won't be easy for me to get out that window. I got to get up out of here. So I realized, I said, I got to trick him into letting me leave. I got to trick him to make him think that, oh, yeah, I'm the type of woman who's going to take this. And that, I, I, yeah, I love you and I understand why you did this. I had to, you know, I felt like I need to make him feel safe, make him feel like I'm not going to end a relationship. So... I sat there and I uh, faked a cry and I sat back and I, you know, he sat on the bed and he was like, baby, I'm so sorry. He said, it's just that every time you get mad and talk about leaving, that scares me. You know, that stuff make me mad because I love you. And he just sitting there talking and my stomach was churning. I'm thinking, I want to get away from this sick guy. This guy, his heart and his mind is messed up. And, you know, he's over here trying to romance me with words after he didn't picked me up by an arm and I was probably about 90 pounds then and tossed me back onto the bed and you know he's talking so I just sat there and I played it off I let him feel empowered I let him feel like okay I'm working on her and it's actually working she's listening to me so I just sit there you know while he was talking I was shaking my head okay 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 and he was like I love you baby I said I love you too and he said give me a kiss 
And I always say, you know, I understand that's one of the most disgusting kisses you can give is giving a man a kiss that you don't want to give him. But my thought, my thing and my thoughts were, I need to get out of this house. And I told him, I said, um, but I got to go to work tomorrow. I need to leave. And even though it was the middle of the day, I don't remember how I convinced him. Um, but I told him, I said, I, I'm really tired. I think I told him I don't need to be on the road at nighttime. So I told him, I said, I need to go home. I'm really tired and everything. But I'm going to call you when I get home. Okay, babe. And he was like, all right. He said, you okay? He said, give me a hug. I said, okay. Gave him a hug. He said, give me a kiss. And everything is just disgusting. But I managed to get up out that house. And I thought to myself, I will never, ever, ever, ever look back. And I got up out of his house. Got in my car. I'm not coming around him no more. And sure enough, when he called me, I told him, I, you know, I got hardcore in. I was like, don't nobody want your crazy stuff. I'm, oh, it's over. Don't call me no more. And what have you. And I, I felt good about myself. I underestimated the crazy. I underestimated the demons that was in that boy. And that, that child showed up in my house again. And like I said, I was about 21 years old. And I was uh, just really messed up myself. I had demons myself. But um, he showed up in my house again. And my sister let him in. I, even after I had told her not to, she sat back and she used to see herself like a big sister. Even though she was a little sister, she always wanted to try to have that little ruling personality where let me talk to him first. And she started trying to talk to him and everything. And she came back. Well, he said, okay, he just want to talk to you. And I was like, little girl, if you don't go sit down. She's like, just, I mean, come out here and talk to him and um, see what he wants. He just says he wants to talk to you. And I went and I got in the truck with this guy. You know the story. If you listen to my testimony, I'm not going to go through the details. But I came outside and he talked. And, you know, he can't. We were in the kitchen. He talked real good. And he said, hey, uh, let's go outside. We got outside and he talked. And, you know, I already had my mind made up. I'm not going back with this guy. I'm not going to be nobody's punching bag. Dude already showed me that he got issues. So I stood there. And I just stood there. And he talked and stuff. And. I don't remember why, how he convinced me to get in the truck with him. He said, let's just go sit in the truck. I don't know if it was uh, cold or hot. I don't remember. I just remember he convinced me to go sit in the truck, and I knew it wasn't a good idea. And once I got in the truck, I noticed that there was no handle to open the door. When I got in the truck, I realized, uh-oh. And as soon as he got in the truck, he put the key in the ignition. He cut the car truck on. I'm like, hold up. We're not supposed to be going over. I thought we were just sitting in the truck. And he started having a meltdown. And he started going off. I love you. I told you that I love you. And you talking about leaving me? And he just had a meltdown. And I sat there and I watched him. And then he started driving off with me in the truck. And I knew. And you've heard this story before. But I knew that I, if I didn't get away, that I wasn't going to be coming back home. I knew that it would end in some kind of standoff with the police. I knew it was going to be a crazy event. Um, I think I recorded the testimony on another audio it's probably already up. It was one of the ones I haven't edited yet. But anyhow, if you hear the story again, you'll know. But anyhow, I sat back and I said, okay, I got to get out of here. That was my, my heart, my mind said, I got to get out of this truck. I got to get away from this guy. Because he's about to take me all the way back to his hometown, which is 45 minutes away. And then once we get there, it's going to turn into him trying to beat on me because he got in his head. I could tell that he was one of those guys who was convinced that women needed to be hit and put in their place. It was going to turn into a rape. It was going to turn into a lot of stuff. And regardless of what people said, let that girl go home. He, wouldn't, he wasn't going to do it. It would have took the police to come out there to get me away from him. And I knew it wasn't going to just be an attack. It was going to be an elevated attack. It's going to be something where he would have probably... Um, did something really, really bad to me. He would have probably disfigured me or something, but I just knew that it was going to be an elevated attack. I had the sense enough to know to get away from this guy. And so the way I got away from him was he was in a car. Um, he was in his truck. He's screaming. He's crying. He's yelling at the top of his lung, and he's trying to convince me that what he's offering me is love. He said, I love you. I love you. And he's just going off, and I don't remember everything he said, but he pulled into a gas station. It was right around the corner, a couple of blocks away from the house I was living in. He pulled into a gas station, and it was a Sunday. And I sat back, and I'm just looking straight up ahead while he's yelling. And the window, I think, was a little bit down. I'm not sure. He pulled into this gas station, and he wasn't getting gas. He wanted to go in and get him something to drink. And then he was going off in the car. And there was a van, I think it was on the other side of us. And the way I know it was a Sunday was because of the way people were dressed. Everybody was dressed for church. And he was going off, and finally, 
he he stopped going off and he said, now I'm about to go in here and get me something to drink. Do you want anything? His voice went down. All of a sudden, he started trying to calm down. He said, do you want anything? Now, I'm in the middle of being kidnapped, <laughs> you know, and this guy's offering to get me something to drink. And I'm sitting in the truck and I'm thinking to myself, I, I got to get out of here. So I told him, I said, no, no, thank you. So he got out the truck and he went on in. And I remember the guy that was in the van next to the vehicle. He got out the van and he was dressed in his suit. He looked like he was about 45, 50 years old. But he was like, baby, he said, you need help. You want me to call the police? And I said, no, thank you. And at the same time, I think I was reaching out the window to open the door. I don't remember if the guy opened the door for me or if I was reaching out the window to open the door. But either way, got that truck door open and I took off running. I, I just went because I knew I was a, f a few blocks from the house. I didn't want to take the risk of standing out there waiting on the police because I knew that the police weren't going to get there fast enough. I knew that I needed to get away from that guy. And I just started running. I took off running. And I just remember all of a sudden, once I hit the, the road behind the gas station, when I hit the street behind the gas station, I heard Tiffany. And he was screaming my name at the top of his lungs. And he was in his pickup truck or his stepdad's pickup truck and chasing me. And I'm on foot. The, the point that I'm trying to make here is that wasn't love. It wasn't love. And I had the sense enough to know it back then. I had the sense enough to know that that wasn't love. I knew that, okay, this is a crazy dude who wants to hit on his woman and control her. That's how I saw him. He wants somebody that he can control. I'm not the one. He wants somebody that he can change. I'm not the one. So I made up my mind. I don't want to be with him. So I ran for my life. I ran for my life. Even though he was pulling his truck up next to me and I would just shoot across people's grass and everything, I had it in my head. I'm not going to be with him. He ain't going to force me to be with him. He's not going to force. Now, somebody who didn't know any better would think, oh, he loved her. Look at him. That's not love. It's not love. But see, when I got married, I didn't have that type of sense because there was somebody that I had made a dedication to. I had given so much up for his sacrifice and I was wearing his last name. So when I got into that abusive relationship in marriage, I convinced myself that I wasn't being abused. I convinced myself that he wanted the best for me. He just had some issues. I convinced myself that we just need to keep him away from being angry because he's a good guy when he's not mad. That was the way that I convinced myself. And that's actually the heart and the mindset of most women who are in abusive relationships. So if you know somebody who's in an abusive relationship, share this audio with them. Because I got to let you know, ladies, for those of you who are in it and for guys, it doesn't get better. It only escalates. That demon in that person is going to continue to push them to, you know, trying to get them to go over the edge, to hit you a little harder, to choke you a little longer, to pick up something a little heavier and hit you with it. It's going to continue to escalate because this person actually likes it. That's why, you know, people keep talking about, I just need to get this guy and get him, get the demons cast out of him. And even on the prayer calls that we have, we have some people putting it, you know, when we go through the deliverance session, I have to tell people, hey, look, take your phone off um, speaker. Because the reality is, I know, I'm not going to even lie. I know that there's some woman there who is trying to cast demons out of her husband or trying to cast demons out the dude she got. And, you know, when you put it on speakerphone, it creates a bad echo where most of the people on the call are having um, trouble hearing and everything is sounding like a repeat. But this woman is sitting back and she's too busy trying to um, get him to hear, thinking that her old um, cheating, abusive husband or boyfriend is going to be sitting there watching TV, trying to ignore her. And then once, you know, I start speaking to the demons, he's going to start convulsing and fall on the floor. And then she can go over there and pick him up and say, see, I told you demons was real. He's going to be a different man. I know the lies the devil tell. The devil will lie to you any day. So this, the point of this audio is to get you to understand that abuse is real. It's not love. The person's not going to change because they don't want to change. And you need to get out that relationship as soon as possible. Love yourself, love your children, and more than anything, love God. Understand that you're not going to get what you want from that person. The only time that person will ever change, in most cases, an abuser doesn't change because they like the power. It's the same thing that Satan wanted. Satan wanted the power and the recognition. They start tapping into the power. They like that feeling. They like how it feels to have power over another human being. So most of the time when you're dealing with an abuser, they don't come to repentance. Now I said most of them, I'm not saying every time. I'm not writing off um, everybody. I am saying that in most cases, you're going to see that the person never gets changed because they like the way it feels. They like the way it feels to play God in your life. They like the way it feels to dominate another human being. They like the way it feels to um, watch you curl up in fear. 
to run from them. They like the way it feels. It makes them feel loved because you stayed. It makes them feel wanted and appreciated. It gives them all of the access to everything they didn't have to work for with you. It gives them access to all these different emotions. And then they get a chance to feel like a God. And that's what they like about it. They love that power. They love the control. They love everything about the abusive experience. And when you're telling them to, you know, stop hitting you and get help. It's like telling a crackhead who loves his crack pipe to give up crack. He's looking at you like, okay, all right, yeah, I know it ain't good for me. Yeah, okay, I get it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But he doesn't want to give it up. When you're dealing with somebody, for example, who's on drugs, who wants to give up the drug, they will actually go and check themselves into a rehab. They'll start taking measure to get changed. But when you're dealing with an abuser, I want you to remember this. They will always make you think they're going to change and that they're looking for help. They're going to always make you think that. They're going to always keep giving you a fantasy and they're going to feed into the fantasy that you have. They're going to keep putting coins and quarters into that fantasy. They keep you riding in your head towards that fantasy. They're going to keep on getting you uh, wound up and getting you excited about the future. All the while making you live in an abusive present. You're going to live that life until you finally realize that that person is who he or she wants to be. And he or she is not willing to change. That's the reality you have to come to. I've come to understand that it's not about the man, you know, or the woman, the abuser coming to repentance and saying, okay, I ain't going to hit this person no more. I come to realize that an abusive relationship most of the time is just for the woman to wake up and realize that this isn't good and that you don't love somebody beyond loving yourself. You don't love somebody beyond loving God. You don't make an idol out of another human being. You can't change somebody. I think it's uh, all about, it's more so about her coming to the reality that I don't have the power to play God in somebody else's life. I don't have the power. And it's about her. And the longer she stays in that relationship, it's just the longer it takes for her to get the message. So anyhow, people of God, I love you. I hope this message bless you and God bless you.